Hey, Bambro here, back with another campaign in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts. Uh, I've done a couple of these already. Uh, have already shown uh, a British campaign, a German campaign. We did a 1910, a 1930. Uh, I think what we'll do here, go ahead and do Germany, just because uh, ostensibly that is the at least slightly more difficult of the two. Um, and we did 1910-1930, so let's do a 1920 this time around. And what that uh, basically will mean is that uh, we'll have Dreadnought-era uh, capital ships, battleships and battlecruisers, but we're likely to still, not guaranteed, uh, we're likely to still have uh, armored cruiser, protected cruiser type hulls for the uh, for the two cruiser classes. But those uh, modern cruiser hulls may be a little bit closer in tech and uh, we may do a little, you know, I may do a little bit more tech investment than I did in the previous two campaigns. Uh, if there's some techs that are pretty close to being discovered right here at the beginning. Go hard difficulty. Uh, leave it on historical. Um, I think that the British AI behavior is probably a little bit more aggressive, and since those are our opponent, we can leave it there. And I am going to start with an auto-generated fleet. Uh, some of the classes may be kind of okay. Some of them may be terrible. It could well be that they're all terrible. Um, but I'm not going to limit myself on the... Uh, replacement classes. I'll, I'll go ahead and design those probably unless I fe just feel like doing a little role playing along the way but I'm not gonna bind myself in that regard. And the one other thing I'm gonna do is uh, basically in the last couple of campaigns they were fairly short uh, because um, you know as soon as the opponent started saying hey uh, we, we've had enough you wanna you wanna call this off? Yeah, you know, I, I think I uh, refused the initial one but uh, accepted pretty quickly, and neither campaign lasted more lasted more than I don't know, a little over a year. Uh, this time around, uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna take it further, and uh, just because you know, from a gameplay perspective, uh, we'll be building some new replacement ship classes. I want this campaign to last long enough where we can see some of those new ships actually get built, enter the fleet, and see some battles and and kind of more highlight the uh, the difference between auto-generated and player-built ships. And then from kind of a role-play, you know, perspective, we can just say, hey, those earlier battles were kind of limited, primarily naval in nature, over some kind of little border or fishing rights squabble. Like limited wars. And this one is a little more substantial. There may be a significant land component that isn't part of the game. Uh, but at least from the perspective of the German Navy, you know, regime change is a central war aim. Uh, you know, our perspective is that the current government, uh, maybe even the, the, uh, the royal family, uh, in the UK, you know, have been very naval aggressive for decades and kind of getting in our business. Uh, and we want that government gone, not just uh, to prevail over the Royal Navy uh, in a temporary sense. That does not mean that we will actually get there. When you get those, uh, you know, hey, they want a peace treaty, what, what do you say? That's not a reply directly to the opponent. That is the Navy's recommendation to their own country's uh, political leadership. You know, that that's not uh, the king asking us for peace. It's the German chancellor <laughs> or the Kaiser telling us, hey, uh, you know, the Brits are talking about peace. What do you think about it? Because sometimes you can say, hey, fight to the end on those choices, but your government makes peace anyway. And other times, 
it's very occasional, but I have seen once or twice that you can agree, but the war goes on. So we'll see what happens. All we can control is on those peace feelers, I'm going to go fight to the end. And that should extend the campaign uh, for some time. So let's uh, get started here and see what kind of uh, auto-generated debacle the AI ship designer hands us. The later the error, the longer it takes the game to kind of generate the scenario because it's going through and kind of uh, randomizing the tech progress. Probably among other things, but that's definitely one thing that uh, gets a little randomized. So every time you do, you know, a 1920 or a 1930 campaign, uh, the tech situation might be a little different. And you may have hulls available in one star that you do not have in another. So I don't think it's probable, but it is possible that we may actually have, you know, maybe like a modern light cruiser hull. Whereas in other 1920 starts, we might not. Okay, uh, just initial glance. We look pretty even in capital ships. We have six. Four battleships, two battlecruisers. The British only have seven. Four and three. He has significantly more cruisers and destroyers. That's to be expected. 23 ships overall compared to 53 overall. So he has more than twice as many ships. But, because we're pretty even in these high tonnage capital ships, I would suspect that we might start this campaign in pretty good uh, position for not getting immediately blockaded. He's got a lot more ships. However, I doubt he's got that much more tonnage than we do and you know the the range on all these auto-generated ships who knows what it is uh these you know it could be anything from minimum to maximum and so we, we don't know what the range situation is and in these campaigns you get a, a lot of information some might think including me maybe unrealistically so a lot of detailed data uh, once you see them in battle of what the characteristics of enemy ships are you know you see the number of guns the mounts you know what kind of ammo they're using how much barbette protection it seems a bit much however one thing that as far as I've ever seen one can never see on an enemy AI ship is I've never seen what their range is. So that remains a guessing game all the way through. Let's see what the AI get gave us. Our battleship. Okay, what, uh, what kind of jumps out immediately here is that's relatively slow for 1920. It's not very high, it's not minimum, but it's not very high range. Few bulkheads, she's gonna flood pretty easy. Cramped, so it's a minimum size crew. Not terrible from a budget perspective, you know, monthly maintenance cost, but even taking light casualties and the ship's performance will be uh, degraded because there's no redundancy in the crew size. You know, one guy does one job, you know, he's the only guy who can do it if he gets a hangnail or something. <laughs> Comes down with the flu, has to go to sick bay. There's no one else to do his job. Uh, okay. Turbine propulsion. He's got some aux and shaft. Balanced rudder. That's going to make for a not very good uh, turning circle, you know? Uh, nerf to turning rate. What is the turning circle? Mm, I think it's in ship details. 632 minimum turning circle. 
torpedo avoidance is going to be an issue with this battleship. A lot of times on the AI designs, you'll see these red, uh, oh, error, right? And that basically kind of means if you tried to build this ship, it would not let you. Not, wouldn't, not in terms of these particular mounts. Uh, the, the autogen can get away with things like that. Okay, very strong barbette protection. Uh, I'm not sure that's the highest possible coupe armor for the era. It might be, but that's pretty good regardless. I'm not going to quibble with that. Uh, level 2 on anti-torp, reinforced bulkheads, and anti-flood. Strong citadel. It's a well-protected ship in terms of the basic hull integrity. Double bottom. Okay, I don't hate any of that. And the tonnage for all this it probably is a big reason why she's a little bit slower and a little bit uh, shorter ranged. Standard shells, increased ammo. All right. Uh, looks like she's actually got torpedoes, apparently. Two powder. I don't hate that. Lower flash fire chance. Which combined with the barbette four. Uh, this ship should not have uh, unusual flash fire problems. Same thing with TNT. Yeah. Pretty, pretty stable uh, ammo setup. Fast slewing turrets, electrical. There's a little bit of flash fire uh, risk to that. But with these other uh, attributes, I, I don't think I'm too worried about that. Standard torque propulsion, 20 inches. Okay, she's got a stereoscopic range finder, uh, level 3. That seems appropriate. She's got some uh, extended torpedo detection capability, and she's got RDF, which is uh, typically the best you can have in 1920. So she won't get a position, but she can get a bearing uh, on unseen ships from... Uh, radio direction finding. Okay, so we had a lot of whole string, you know, stronger whole kind of uh, stuff up here, but this is pretty light armor. Not digging that so much. We're going to need a lot of this hull integrity up here cuz she's she's going to get penetrated by enemy battleship and battle cruiser guns. That's just all there is to it. I, I, this is almost like lower end battle cruiser or even uh, heavy cruiser uh, armor. She's pretty thin skinned. Okay. Well, that's what we have to work with for a battleship. Oh, what was her arm? 15 inch guns. Triple turrets. I don't mind triple turrets in 1930. In 1920, triple turrets have a pretty significant accuracy penalty because the technology is not yet fully mature. It's kind of a late breaking innovation in 1920. That doesn't bode well for this ship's accuracy. Um. Let's have a look at the pitch and roll and stuff. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> no. Oh. Even aside from the way she moves in seas, we've got a 40.5 forward weight offset. And that's primarily coming from the fact that we've got two triple 15 inch turrets stacked up here close to the bow and only one back aft so she sits way bow heavy we've also got uh, you know a lot of weight throughout the length of the ship and a lot of these little triple secondaries what are these by the way uh, There's some 7-inch guns in the casemates. 
There's some six inch guns, all the summer center line, five lots of five inch guns, and the, these five inch guns are kind of stacked here pretty close to the gunnel. Anyway, she's got uh, 46.4 pitch, 57. I've never seen a roll that high. This will not hurt that much in perfectly flat, calm seas, but if there's any seas at all, you know, look at these accuracy penalties from sea waves and cruising speed maneuvering. Nice 15 inch guns, but she's not going to be able to hit squat with them. All right, thanks, previous. Uh, Navy minister for handing me this. All right, well, it is what it is. Let's see what our battle cruiser looks like. I'll try not to spend as much time on that. Four triple turrets without even, yeah, oh, my. if anything, it's actually worse. 46 forward weight offset. 74 pitch, 71 roll. Man, this thing's just bobbing like a cork all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> like a slight breeze. Oh, 23 knots. That's all, that's pretty slow for a 1920 battle cruiser. Minimum range, few bulkheads. Yeah. This thing's a dog. Yeah, you know, similar kind of, you know, good barbette. Anti-torp, anti-flood, reinforced bulkheads are okay. Double hull, big, you know, strong citadel. But if we look at our armor, yep, it's even worse. We're almost venturing into like light cruiser levels of armor. Six-inch main belt. Almost non-existent deck. Very, very light forward and aft belts. This is not encouraging. Coincidence rangefinder, but it's a good one. It's a high end one. Hydro 3. Well, at least you'll be able to see torpedoes. A little bit more volatile on the uh, ammo choices. I think that's going to be. and heavy shells. I mentioned this in the in the last toward the end of the last campaign, but uh, these light standard and heavy shells are a little bit non-intuitive in that uh, heavy shells have an accuracy penalty, and light shells have an accuracy buff. But that's not the whole story. Um, the shell itself may have this little nerf, however, because it's firing. A heavier shell at a little bit longer range the gun becomes more accurate so generally speaking and I just caught on to this myself a day or two ago heavy shells actually results in more accuracy in light shells in less accuracy despite the uh, the nerfs and buffs shown in their tooltip because it doesn't just change what the shell gives you, but it also changes what the gun can do. And uh, the gun's accuracy buff from firing a heavy shell is greater than the accuracy nerf of the shell itself. I'm sure there's all kinds of ballistics and calculations which kind of support that, but uh, I'm not sure I get it all. <laughs> any case our capital ships uh, kinda have a similar design philosophy what size are these guns? Uh, they are 14 inchers triples I think I would much prefer to see double turrets just in general double turrets of a slightly smaller but still effective caliber uh, on both the Battlecruiser A and B battleship. And no doubt when we get around to designing replacement classes for these things, uh, I'll go more in that direction. 
our armored cruiser is actually not an armored cruiser. Looks like we do have the modern heavy cruiser hull available because that's what this is. So that's good. Um, kind of a weird gunnery setup though. Um, looks like we've got main battery, six inch guns on a heavy cruiser. A lot of them. And we got some triple four inchers. You know, she's got a lot of guns, but they're low caliber. I am not optimistic that this ship is going to stand up well against, uh, you know, one for one against British heavy cruisers. Does have more range than the capitals. That's all right. Don't like the few bulkheads. Uh, that's a pretty slow cruiser. It does have a lot of crew. All this stuff is all right. Barbette 3, anti torp Anti-Flood 3. Only Harvey armor, though. That's pretty low-end armor for 1920. 45% armor strength. And single hauled. I don't hate the coincidence rangefinder, especially since our guns are kind of low caliber and don't shoot that far anyway. That makes sense for her armament. Um, that could be a little bit better, but she's got something for torpedo spotting. But look at this. You, you know, not as high quality with Harvey, but. She's got significantly more armor than the battlecruiser does. Kind of decent belts, maybe not uh, as high as I'd like. Uh, pretty, pretty well armored decks, which you know philosophically doesn't match up well, right? If you're going to build. a heavy cruiser and your design philosophy is we're gonna go light calibers but have a ton of guns that kinda of necessitates you know kind of assumes hey you're building this thing for a close range fight and you know you're trying to overwhelm the enemy with volume of fire within ranges at which these smaller guns are effective your rangefinder choice supports that coincidence which is more of a short range range finder than the stereoscopic and then you put a lot of armor weight into deck armor right and you this is primarily for protection against plunging shots which come from longer range if you get within the ranges where these guns do something in, in, in this coincidence range finder you're close enough that your incoming fire isn't going to have much plunging fire okay well that's what we got um, let's see what they did to the stability of this thing okay not as bad as the capital ships she's a slight bit front heavy but I think that's livable um, we got 24 pitch and 14 roll. Uh, probably a little bit more than we would typically have if we designed these things ourselves. But uh, for a knowledge in ship, it's not terrible. She does have, you're seeing here, I'm seeing a, a quad launcher here, a triple launcher here. She does have pretty significant torpedo capability. Yeah. two quads and two triples so we can fire a spread of seven torpedoes to either side and how many shots do we have a reduced ammo torps which basically means nice spread but it's going to be a one shot deal once they fire there's there's not going to be reloads eh. they're also 18 inch which is the smallest uh, I think that's the smallest available torpedo size in 1920. You know, they could be 20 or even 21 inches. 
All right then. At least she's got a little bit of range that may or may not help with the blockade situation. Our light cruiser. Okay, we've got the modern light cruiser design as well. Lots of torps. I see three quad launchers per side. That's a spread of up to 12 uh, torpedoes with standard ammo. So she's got reloads as well. A little bit bigger torpedo. Fast propulsion. So we give up some range, but they'll be harder to dodge. Um, she's actually got a little bit heavier armament caliber wise than the heavy cruiser does some seven inch guns five of them double turrets okay um, and her secondaries are three and two inch eh. I don't love it I don't I don't think I hate it either um, but look at how they're you know how these uh, secondaries and, and these really heavy torpedo launchers are perched right here on the deck edge. I would imagine she's got a pretty heavy roll. Oh my goodness. 89.4 roll. 54 pitch. Golly. That's going to make for some terrible accuracy. And so, so front heavy. Uh, 87 longitudinal weight offset. To be honest, I'm not really sure why. Uh, these are really long deck houses. And they're spread apart. That contributes. But we've got uh, two main turrets aft, two forward. This one sits right in the middle. I think that excessive pitch or longitudinal forward weight offset comes from the way that these two turrets are crammed so far forward not quite as much as the aft turrets are and this looks central but this is kind of forward to the center of gravity a little bit and we in you know torpedo launchers are really heavy so these four forward uh, torpedo launchers are contributing to that weight offset forward I think I would much prefer to have seen dispensing with this uh, midships turret here, cramming these two, uh, you know, the, the forward and secondary aft uh, towers closer together, touching. This funnel right here would sit within the aft tower. We wouldn't have to give up a funnel for that. Um, I'd probably dispense with. Uh, at least a pair of these torpedo launchers and move these forward and aft turrets uh, back and forward and I think that would do wonders for both our pitch and our weight offset and probably get ridding, getting rid of a pair of uh, torpedo launchers would significantly help roll as well. Also these are I think 3 inch turrets I think those would sit right here you know one of these pair of uh, guns could sit right up here on the uh, aft deck house all right well that's what they gave us and then finally a look at our destroyer well the, the biggest thing that jumps out initially is wow that's a lot of torpedoes that can't be a bad thing. Looks like uh, three quad launchers and a triple launcher. And uh, a single launcher up forward. Let me guess. This thing has got big... One hundred longitudinal weight. I don't see how this is possible. I thought that if you had aft weight offset this number would be negative like negative 100 and that's what I would expect here with so much torpedo weight aft 
I think this just must be 100 in either direction. Because this has to be an aft heavy ship. They're guaranteed to be. Either way, it's just as bad in either direction. Look at that, minus 30% base accuracy. The roll's not bad. They typically aren't on destroyers since just about everything goes center line. Uh, and the pitch isn't terrible, but that's completely overshadowed by how how aft heavy she is. Okay. Bottom line, we have five ship types and they're all dogs. Just dogs. To the point it's hard to even know where to prioritize uh, our shipbuilding. Okay. Well, the main thing is we need to prevent blockade and and we need to conserve budget so that we can build a lot more new ships so I think the strategy I'm going to pursue here is that the entire fleet is going to oh no we don't want this I don't want anything in sea control that costs money money that we're going to need to build ships so everything goes in being first. <clears throat> and even though they're terrible, for the moment, we're, we're pretty much counterbalancing, in the big picture, we're counterbalancing British capital ships with our own. So I think gonna focus first on a new heavy cruiser class, a new light cruiser class, and, and plus those will build a little bit quicker as well, and uh, get those out into the fleet. Let's have a look at uh, research and see what theoretically might be close at hand that we could uh, design achieve quickly. In two months we could have electro-hydraulic electro steering 2. Uh, I think that's worth getting. If it were six months away, maybe not. At two months, yeah, I think we could do that. We could have advanced battlecruiser 3 in five months. Um, we currently have Advanced Battle Cruiser 2. You know, I think that's enough. Others might be different. I typically don't build a lot of Battle Cruisers anyway. Uh, my philosophy or my viewpoint is just kind of, you know, what does a Battle Cruiser give you that a battleship doesn't? Uh, historically or in game whatever it, it basically it gives up a little bit of armor in order to get more speed than a typical battleship well the other way to skin that cat is you can build a faster battleship uh, and early on in the dreadnought era maybe 1910 uh, or you know 1905 1906 is when the real world dreadnought was built that's a meaningful distinction uh, by 1920, the battleships are getting faster, and the utility of the battlecruiser starts to get a little bit more fuzzy. Um, that distinction between the two types just gets muddier and muddier, to the point where by the time you get, you know, like World War II battleships, you know, things like the Iowa class and 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 the and her earlier sisters, like the Washington, you know, the, uh, the North Carolinas and the South Dakotas, you know, they're battleships and they're fast. Uh, they're, you know, so is it really a really, is it a heavily armed battlecruiser or is it a really fast battleship? It's kind of two sides of the same coin. It, in any case, if I want to build a capital ship with a lot of capability, 
it's going to cost a lot. I, I just typically go for the battleship myself. So I'm not too terribly enamored of this uh, Battle Cruiser 3 uh, hull. We're also close to some type of shells, super heavy shells. Yeah, I'll go for that. Two months away. What else is close? Small guns. Mark IV, four, four inch guns. I like four inch guns. Um, you know, the fours and fives tend to be, I typically sprinkle a few of those on just about every cruiser or uh, capital ship design. I wouldn't mind having that. I don't know if I want to, in yeah, seven months, I don't know if I want to have 100% tech budget for that long. Everything else is uh, almost a year or way more than a year away. But uh, the good steering, the super heavy shells, Yeah, I am going to, for the first, it's going to be a big budget hit, but I'll keep tech budget 100 for a bit. It may actually dig into our naval funds. I'm not, I could get myself in a little bit of temporary budget trouble doing that. We know we want 100% crew training. And we know we need to keep up on transport capacity. I'm kind of assuming that people know, understand the, well, this number, annual revenue, that is the government's budget. 100% transport capacity maintains this level. If it goes below, the economy shrinks. This number, annual economic growth, that, that's not implemented. This will always be zero. Okay, that's just not in the game. What is in the game is if you go below 100 on transport, this government annual revenue shrinks. If you go above 100%, this will expand. The monthly naval budget is a percentage, uh, I think 0.06%. Of the annual revenue. So as the economy expands, our own naval funds expand a little bit too. And as long as the annual revenue uh, stays at least level uh, or preferably uh, increases, then you, you don't have unrest problems. If this transport capacity goes too low and the annual revenue shrinks, unrest starts to go up. And, you know, the newspapers, the public opinion, they're not happy. And not they're not and they're not just unhappy with us. They're unhappy with the government. This is basically what drives the revolution, you know, government overthrown campaign end is unrest. Naval prestige, and I think some of that drives both of these. I'm not 100% sure. But uh, Naval Prestige is basically opinion specifically of the Navy. Uh, and there may be a public opinion component to that related to the transport and economy. But also, if you lose battles, right, you ships sink, then the government takes an increasingly dim view of your own competence as the... Uh, naval minister or of or as the head admiral whichever <laughs> so naval prestige you want going up up is good unrest you want low zero preferably zero for that anyway for all those reasons maxing out transport capacity this is the rate at which we're building new transports if things are really bad and we're blockaded, even 100% may not be enough 
to overcome all the transports being sunk. Later on, if we get in a really good situation, you know, like if hypothetically we actually blockade the British, they're not sinking any of our merchants, and we get up around, I don't know, 120% or something, then you can start to play with this, you know, uh, you know, at some point you can start playing with this slider, but we're definitely going to start at 100%. Normally, I would, normally I would uh, just zero out the tech budget. And that's where most of our budget flexibility comes from for shipbuilding. I'm gonna I'm gonna bite the bullet for 100% just to get those couple of techs, the heavy shells and the steering. Which means uh, I'm gonna burn through our naval uh, funds real real quick. Now what happens if this gets to zero? If I burn through uh, all these funds and actually go negative in our naval funds, this is kind of our reserve, that's not the end of the game. The government will give you more money. Um, at very least, they'll give you a big lump sum to get your naval fund reserve back up. Uh, and they, I'm, I'm not really sure if they actually increase your percentage and give you a higher monthly budget coming in. I haven't really paid that much attention because I haven't done this very often. However, that will come at the cost of a pretty big hit to naval prestige. And that's something we would like to avoid. You know, we, we could have some early victories, build the prestige up a little bit, then run out of money, and it would put us in the negative and and uh, undo that kind of uh, goodwill we had built up with the political bosses. If things are going badly, if you're losing ships and you run out of money, um, you know, you could just get fired <laughs> eventually. If you, you know, if you've asked for money a couple of times, they're not seeing the payoff. You know, the ships are still sinking. You know, okay. Admiral Brambro is not getting the job done, and that will end the campaign too. But just going below once, does, that's not the end of the campaign. And that might actually happen in this case. Okay. So, um, initially our available budget is going to tech. We're going to wait for a couple of techs, so not going to design any new ships immediately. The one other thing I want to do is we know that the the transport losses are calculated basically in this North Sea area. We want all of our ships in these seven ports. We don't want any operational ships over here in the Baltic, in Danzig or Palau. And luckily, here at the beginning, we don't have any there. But that's just something we're just going to have to keep a continuous eye on. Because after battles and for repairs and stuff, the game will send ships back over here. So that's a continuous thing to keep an eye on. Okay, so we've had a look at the initial fleet. Uh, kind of gone over the basic uh, budget and initial strategy. And in the next episode... Uh, We'll do the first month or two and see what kind of battles uh, crop up. Thanks for watching.